Some figures. Okay, latest water test. Tested the rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. So 13,100 is pretty damn much, folks. It used to be zero. Then it was 100s in the 2000s. And then in, uh, since 2010, it's into the 1,000s and the latest 13,100. In the snow on Mount Shasta, pristine Mount Shasta, 61,000 feet. No, excuse me, 8,000 foot level, 61,000 micrograms per liter. Four times the amount that is found in the soil up there. Where in the hell is this stuff coming from if it's not coming from the soil? Okay, pH of acid soils is 20 times more alkaline. The aluminum in the soil has doubled in the last 10 years. The rain normal was 5.6, it's 20 times more alkaline. Aluminum blocks essential nutrients. I am unable in my garden to restore normal pH, and that's because nanoparticles are now in the circulatory systems of both plants and humans. So welcome. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the HARP uh, electromagnetic or radio frequency, radar frequency uh, that is controlling the geoengineering materials. And so here's Dane. This is HARP. For those that don't know what HARP is, it's an ionosphere heater that's part of these programs. So as they spray these particulates, it makes the atmosphere more conductive, more electrically conductive. These are incredibly huge and powerful ground-based facilities that they use to manipulate these particulates. Remote control clouds. So when you have clouds. the polarization of these particulates that's sensitive to radio frequency, they can cause those particulates to scatter out and cover the sky, or they can cause them to attract and come together Heat or and cool. form big enough condensation nuclei to cause rain. Again, playing God with the weather with extremely toxic materials. That facility can put out about 3 billion watts of power, billion with a B. Uh, it's capable of heating the ionosphere to 15,000 degrees heating Fahrenheit over areas hundreds of square miles. What they're doing to our climate system is beyond science fiction, but it's fact. This looks like something from a science fiction movie. They also movie. have these ships. That's the same type of facility on a mobile a platform. It's called SBX radar, sea-based X-band radar, for the same purpose, manipulating the climate system. Again, the polar vortex, does that look natural to you? These giant dips that are only coming down over North America. Last no. winter, we had temperatures in the lower 48 that were colder than the North Pole. They're manipulating the that? jet stream. Because they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. They push cold air south. They nucleate that moisture with chemical ice nucleation to cool it off, to create headlines, to make it appear geoengineering is working. It's not working. This is the polar vortex from this week. Now, I ask anybody, if anybody that knows anything about meteorology... It doesn't look natural. That's unprecedented. To have a giant teardrop of cold air in one part of the country while the rest of the country fries, while Siberia fries, this is simply... Um, it's like a bunch of kids in a sandbox... Thank God with, with the weather. Unimaginably a war with toys Mother Nature. Just experiment Sweet and simple. Um, this jet engine is very simple. It's, uh, it sucks. Um, it compresses. It bangs and it blows. And so what happens is these turbines suck the air in, increasing the amount of density of the air. It goes into a, ch a combustion chamber where it's uh, heated and expands again, comes out as thrust at a very high temperature, similar to when you blow up a balloon and let the balloon go and it goes straight you know, flying off. Now, when that hot air exits the tailpipe, um, this occurs, uh, the contrails, not the chemical, the contrails occur because of cold air, minus 30. It takes a high altitude, around 30,000 feet plus, and that air turns to, there's a carbon dioxide and water vapor in that exhaust. That turns to ice crystals, and that's what you see, the white stream behind it. Those white crystals uh, of ice um, um, warm up, dissolve, and the smoke goes away. And it never lasts more than a minute. Usually it's in seconds, depending on outside air conditions. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, and I started looking at the skies, and these are not normal. They're not natural. 
there's something going on. I don't know who it is or why they're doing it. All I can testify is it's not natural and it's not normal. It's got to be some outside influence doing that. Thank you. Statement issued by the United States Air Force that contrails become visible roughly about a wingspan behind an aircraft. A Boeing 757 has a wingspan of about 125 feet. That means behind the engines of that aircraft, you will see a chemtrail of 125 feet that will quickly dissipate. Evergreen modif uh, Aviation emits the weather modification spraying. I got a patent number here. They call them chem bombs. Got a beautiful picture that you can go online and find. Tons of aerosol can be released in a line up to 250 miles or in huge clusters. That's when you see the interruptions in the sky of uh, batches of artificial cirrus clouds. However, behind an aerosol spraying aircraft, they stream, persist, and according to the winds aloft, will dissipate only after hours of lingering because the chemicals are falling out of the sky onto the planet. I'm also a pilot, and I've flown into Travis Air Force Base on several occasions. There's a whole area designated to replenishing these planes that fly and drop this chemical on us. It's totally guarded. The people that are loading these planes with the chemicals are dressed in complete hazmat outfits. So if this is not harmful, why are they in a complete hazmat outfit? For those of you who don't know what a hazmat outfit, it looks like a spacesuit. So they're wearing this and we're not. As a doctor, I can tell you there's been about a 25% increase in lung problems in this area and in most areas that they're spraying. Secondly, I concur about the increase in number of Alzheimer's. They have since been able to take the aluminum and micronize it, which means it'll stay up longer. But it also means, and I don't know if any of you have noticed some metallic taste in your mouth when they're spraying, but you inhale that, it goes up through your cribriform plate and into your, through your sinuses, and into the brain. If you remember eight to 10 years ago, there was this big move to get rid of aluminum from underarm deodorant, because it calls Alzheimer's. <laughs> Look what they're doing to us now. Agency I've called, I've been stonewalled. Oh, this is being put on by the UN. Now, since when does the UN have airspace activity over the United States of America, or also over any other country, for that matter? And if if that's the case, who's paying for it? And I bet you the taxpayers. <laughs> so all I can say is it's about time we get up in arms about this. So all I can say is it's about time we get up in arms about this because it is affecting our health. I look around and I see people are starting to look up and see this. Many times I've spoken about air <laughs> chemtrails and I get this blank look on my face. What are you talking about? I'm saying, look up. As a pilot, but before I fly, I look up. And so, boy, they're really out there working. If you've ever seen or heard of a grain silo explosion where particles of grain grind against one another, produce a dust, and then one spark will set it all off in an explosion. This is kind of exemplary of what nanoparticles represents in terms of the impact that they have on the environment. Because you can spread so many small little particles through the environment, it dramatically increases the surface area that's in that environment because there's so many of them. When you look up at the sun and you see a white haze, that is aluminum floating in the air right now, and it's coming from the aircraft. Now, as it happens, the Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat Alveolar Macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. So it suppresses your immune system. But they also found that these same particles, once they get into your system, they can actually go through the barrier in each one of the cells. They get inside the cells, and these particles can actually suppress the ability of mitochondria which are in the cells that help to gobble up toxins and things that would be harmful to the nucleus and the, the reproduction process of the cells in your body. These processes are suppressed. And so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. Now, in addition to this, 
the materials that are going into the environment right now, aluminum oxide nanoparticles and barium nanoparticles, these just happen to be the same materials that they use in nanothermate explosives. And so when this stuff settles down out of the air into the environment, it is small enough to be absorbed through the root structure of the trees in the forest. And so when there's a forest fire, and there will be a forest fire, those fires burn dramatically hotter. The example out here in Ono is just one example. Wow, that was fast. It goes by things coming from sky down. And it's a huge, huge problem. Because as it comes down, what happens is a couple of things. Is that it actually is in our air, we breathe it. And as we breathe it, it's actually going to go up through our nostrils, into our brain, easiest access to our brain frontal lobe. The contaminants that are in that have been identified, which already been mentioned, are aluminum. Aluminum is the number one neural uh, free radical generator to the brain to cause early apoptosis, which is early death of brain, and it begins to set off the scar tissue, which we call the amygdalin, which is a pot, which is part of the uh, chemical matrix related to Alzheimer's. That's problem number one because when we look at the Alzheimer issue, we say those are the old. The real problem is, and the real scare I have, is as I am a father of two, I am a grandfather of three, my youngest one will be getting married next August, or this August, hopefully she will um, be able to spawn and have some children of her own, and then we'll have more. So the whole process is, is that in what we have going on is our children, when they're playing outside, your emblem says, come, come to the North State, enjoy us, enjoy the mountains, the streams, the fish, etc. Come to us and bring your resources and your money, and children go outside and play. In the last five years, I do alternative medicine, which means we're looking for those things. I was part of the early group that was looking for aluminum and ADD and ADHD. And all of those children that started to develop those phenomena at high levels of aluminum, when we figured out protocols to detox them out, to free the body of those particular contaminants,